Good evening to each one of you. It is really a privilege to be back here in what we have come to feel is our second home away from home. We've been on the road for six months. We've been traveling all around the United States and Canada. And uh, we are just very, we just pulled into California today. And uh, we are now going to have some meetings around here in this area uh, for a couple of weeks. So we are delighted to be here. We are just uh, uh, very happy that uh, we can spend this part of our itinerary back in Mentone. It's been many, many years since we've had the opportunity to be here, and we really appreciate you folks and this church. Now, I have some unfortunate news to share with you. Um, I've been doing this for 33 years now, and there's always been a fair amount of disagreement and uncertainty about various things, and some people like what I have to say, and some people don't like what I have to say. You know how that is. But last year, last year, I have never seen an assault made upon present truth, at least the present truth that I know about, and that others have been sharing over the years as well, not just me. Uh, I've never seen an assault on present truth like last year. Four books came out all at one time. That wasn't an accident, certainly wasn't an accident. All with one objective, to destroy any idea of a last generation who will vindicate God's name by overcoming sin. That was the objective of these books. I'll be sharing more specifically about that tomorrow afternoon. So this year, I decided that my presentations at this church, because you folks know me, you folks know that I am not a, uh, one who opposes the church. I love the church. Uh, the church has made me everything that I am, and I appreciate that very much. But there are some, some things of concern that need to be addressed and so this year, I'm going to address those concerns. Um, when those four books came out, um, the three pastors of the Sacramento Central Church, you've probably watched some of their presentations uh, on archive or live stream, the three pastors decided something had to be done. And so uh, they organized a seminar in which several individuals were asked to make presentations at this seminar. One was Dr. Domsteed, who is a retired professor from Andrews University at the seminary. Another was Larry Kirkpatrick, the uh, pastor of this church for a number of years. Another was um, Dr. Norman McNulty. Some of you may know that he was one of the ones who founded and uh, established Advent Hope over at Loma Linda. And Audioverse. If you've had a chance to listen to Audioverse, he was one of the ones who began that as well. So we were fortunate that he, who is now a doctor over in Tennessee, was willing to come over and be part of this seminar at Sacramento Central. That was the spring of this year in which this happened. Uh, and so uh, what I'm going to do this weekend here with you is to share the presentations I made at that time. Some of you have heard them and seen them, but some of you haven't. And even if you have, a second time around is not so bad. I've always found that you get more the second time than the first time of hearing a, a new message. And so I'm going to be presenting what I presented there, as well as some other material which is on the same line, dealing with these uh, assaults that are being made right now. I would suggest to you, my friends, that Satan knows that his time is short, and he's going to do everything he can to persuade us that we're on the wrong track, that we have misunderstood everything, that we need to get with it and get more balanced and more middle of the road and get things just, you know, like everybody would be happy with. I'm convinced that right now uh, the assaults mean that uh, we're very close to the second coming of Christ or he wouldn't be this involved in attacking the foundation pillars as I see it 
of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So that's what we're going to be doing this weekend. This weekend is rather intense, and it's going to be something that uh, we're really going to... Uh, I will do my very best to uh, make it clear as to what is happening and why it's important. All right, with that introduction, and we've had our prayer, we are ready to begin. You see the title of this evening's presentation, The Trojan Horse. The basic story is very familiar. The Greeks were determined that they were going to uh, conquer the independent city of Troy, but they were having a lot of difficulty. They laid siege to the city, and for 10 years, they couldn't breach the walls of the city. So they came up with a very unusual strategy. They constructed a huge wooden horse. They hid a select force of men inside that horse. They rolled it up near the walls of the city, and then they disappeared. They got under their boats and sailed off as if they had lost the battle. Ten years was too much, and they were giving up. They were gone. Well, the Trojans had a little more curiosity than caution, and they pulled that horse into their city as a symbol of their triumph over the hated enemy outside the city. And you know the story. That night, the Greek soldiers crept out of the horse, opened the gates of the city for the Greek army, which had sailed back under cover of darkness. The city of Troy was taken, and the war was over. A ten-year war was over. The strength of Troy's defenses were breached by deception and curiosity. And you know, we may be prepared for a direct attack, but totally unprepared for an unexpected diversion, which we weren't looking for. There's another story that comes from World War II. The French had faced invasion from Germany in World War I, and they were determined that was not going to happen again. So they built a line of concrete fortifications and obstacles and weapons in the 1930s, on the borders with Italy and Switzerland and Germany and Luxembourg, the Germans would never invade France again. They were certain of that. So what did the Germans do? They ignored that Maginot line completely, and they invaded France from the north through the Low Countries and the Ardennes Forest, where the French thought the rough terrain would never be a place for an invasion to take place. Just couldn't happen. Meanwhile... A German force sat outside or opposite the Maginot Line to occupy the attention of the French and think they were coming in from that direction. The major problem with the Maginot Line was the false sense of security that it gave the French. Have we had Trojan horses and Maginot Lines in the recent history of Adventism? I submit that we have had exactly the same problem of curiosity and a false sense of security. We've got everything covered. We've been successfully invaded while our guard was down. Adventist truths for a long time have been under assault from the beginnings of the church, and we prepared our defenses very carefully to meet the objections to our doctrines and our beliefs and our system of understanding. We had well-defined responses to Catholicism, for instance, and to liberal Protestantism. So the master strategist, Satan, devised a Trojan horse to attract our curiosity and lower our sense of danger. You see, we're not the only church to believe in the absolute authority of the Bible and the soon coming of Jesus Christ. Our evangelical friends seem to be much like us in personal salvation through Christ's shed blood alone, as well as a strong drive for soul winning and reaching out to others and bringing them into the church and to salvation. We feel that we can learn a lot from them in terms of uh, growth of churches, in terms of attractive worship methods, and especially the retention of our youth. We have fought the enemy of worldly standards and the lack of faith in liberalism for many years, but we have been blind to the equally dangerous enemy of conservative evangelicalism. 
So our curiosity and our sense of doctrinal security allowed us to, uh, to bring the Trojan horse of evangelicalism right into the heart of Adventist beliefs. And the danger for us is the same as for the people of Troy, the complete destruction of this movement and this message. And just by the way, some of you remember a person named Desmond Ford. He was not a liberal. He was a conservative, evangelical Adventist. So we're talking about that phase of understanding our message. So let's take a close look at this iron Trojan, well, wooden Trojan horse that is currently sapping the life out of Adventism. Uh, what is the heart of this well-defined set of beliefs about salvation? We're going to take a quick look. There are five major issues at the root of this gospel. Number one, involuntary sin. That's the belief that every one of us becomes sinners simply by being born. Number two, the unfallen nature of Christ. That's the belief that the humanity that Christ took upon himself was the sinless nature of Adam before the fall, or that he had a hybrid nature, partly fallen and partly unfallen. Number three, salvation by justification alone. That's the belief that the ground of the Christian salvation is justifying righteousness only as distinct from the transforming, transforming, empowering righteousness of regeneration and sanctification, which is considered only a result of being saved. Number four, justification is exclusively declarative, not transformative. This is the belief that justifying righteousness only declares a person righteous as distinct from actually making him righteous. And number five, the imperfectibility of Christian character. This is the belief that even through the imparted righteousness of Christ and divine strength, perfect obedience to the law of God remains impossible as long as we live on this earth. Those are the five major points of evangelical theology of salvation. In light of the beliefs of this evangelical gospel, it's very imperative that we understand the true gospel. Now, I've covered that in previous uh, years here. I'm not going to go through all of the details that I've done here in years past. This is a very, very brief summary of my responses to these five points. And here we go. 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. You know what? Ellen White calls this the clear definition of sin, the true definition of sin, and eight times the only definition of sin. In commenting on this verse, she says it means to willfully transgress the law of God in thought or word or action. James chapter 4, verse 17. Therefore to him that knoweth do, to do good, and doeth it not... To him it is sin, to the one who knows what is right and wrong. John 9, 41, Jesus said unto them, these are the Pharisees, If ye were blind, ye should have no sin. Blind means ignorance here. But now ye say, we see, we understand, we're intelligent, therefore your sin remaineth. So the sin for which we are accounted guilty and condemned and lost is never involuntary or a state of birth. It is always a decision that we make. All right, number two. Just this one paragraph from Desire of Ages, page 49. It would have been an almost infinite humiliation for the Son of God to take man's nature even when Adam stood in his innocence in Eden. But Jesus accepted humanity when the race had been weakened by 4,000 years of sin. And here's the key phrase. Like every child of Adam, that's you and me, he accepted the results of the working of the great law of heredity. What these results were is shown in the history of his earthly ancestors. He came with such a heredity to share our sorrows and temptations and to give us the example of a sinless life. 
Just that paragraph says that Christ did not exempt himself from our nature so that he could be tempted in the same way that we are, both from outside and from within his own nature. And most of our powerful temptations come from within our own nature. Numbers 3 and 4. Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 394. Having made us righteous through the imputed righteousness of Christ, God pronounces us just and treats us as just, therefore being justified by faith. My friends, justification can never be limited to declaration alone. It is always a transforming process. It makes us right before God declares us right, or else God would be telling an untruth. And then number five. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Do you think every thought of Christ was in, in, in captivity to his father? And look at the results in his life. Why shouldn't it be the same with us? In heavenly places, 146, and notice how it starts. Everyone, that's every one of us, everyone who by faith obeys God's commandments will, not may, not must, not should, will reach the condition of sinlessness in which Adam lived before his transgression. One of Satan's most accepted lies throughout the Christian world and even in Adventism is that perfect obedience to God is impossible as long as we have fallen natures. It just can't happen. Now, one thing here. It's very important to remember that this kind of character maturity that these statements are talking about, this is not a requirement for salvation as demonstrated by the thief on the cross. Remember that story? He certainly was not spiritually mature. If he would have come down from the cross, he would have had some growing to do just like all of us. But he surrendered his life in faith to God, willing to do and be whatever God asked him to be. And that's what God asks of us if we want to have a saving relationship with him. Total surrender of our lives to him. Mature character perfection is for a completely different purpose, and we're going to look at that right here for a moment. Desire of Ages 671. The honor of God, the honor of Christ is involved in the perfection of the character of his people. See, it's not our honor here or even our salvation, but it's God's name and his character. He has promised that he will perfect his people, and the question is, can he do it? Has he gone one step too far? Will his promise be kept? Christ's Object Lessons 148. The honor of his throne is staked for the fulfillment of his word unto us. Whenever God promises something, he puts his name behind that promise. His name, his authority, his throne was at stake, wasn't it, when Christ came down to this earth? His throne was at stake. And it is going to be at stake in what he will do through the final generation once again. His name. Now, we must remember Satan's challenge against God and his law. Signs of the Times, January 16, 1896. Satan declared that it was impossible for the sons and daughters of Adam, that's you and me, to keep the law of God. And thus charged upon God a lack of wisdom and love. If they, that's you and me could not keep the law, then there was fault with the lawgiver. So Satan's charge was clearly leveled against fallen man's ability to keep God's law. So God has devised a response to Satan's charge, which will be so clear that not one question will be left in the minds of anyone in God's universe as to whether God can keep his promises. Revelation 7, 1 to 3 tells us that the winds of destruction are being held right now until God's people are sealed in their foreheads. So what is this seal? Faith I live by, 287. It is a settling into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually, so they cannot be moved. It's more than just keeping the Sabbath. 
It's a settling into God's truth. So we cannot be moved. But it's more than intellectual. It has to do with the heart. And again, surrender. In a very special vision, Ellen White saw the angels of Revelation 7 getting ready to loose those four winds that we have read about. Early Writings 38. While their hands were loosening. This is in Ellen White's lifetime. And the four winds were about to blow. The merciful eye of Jesus gazed on the remnant that were not sealed. And he raised his hands to the Father and pleaded with him that he had spilled his blood for them. Then another angel was commissioned to fly swiftly to the four angels and bid them hold until the servants of God were sealed. So... The reason Christ did not come during her lifetime and has not come in our lifetime yet is God's mercy. He will never send his remnant into the cataclysmic struggles of the last-ish time of planet Earth while they are unprepared for it, not ready to go through it. And the only way they can be prepared is by receiving the seal of God. These people, this last generation are facing the greatest challenges that have ever faced the people of God. They are facing the close of human probation that has never happened in all Earth's history. And they are facing Satan's last desperate attempt to destroy the credibility of God's name. This is a big issue. And so we read here in Testimonies, Volume 5, 746. If there was ever a people in need of constantly increasing light from heaven, it is the people that in this time of peril God has called to be the depositaries of his holy law and to vindicate his character before the world. If that can ever be done, it demands a full understanding of the plan of salvation and our place in the completion of that plan. Desire of Ages 763. Every character will be fully developed, and all will show whether they have chosen the side of loyalty or that of rebellion. Then the end will come. God will vindicate his law and deliver his people. Please note, God does the vindicating of his own law and his own name, but he will do it in the characters of those who have chosen to surrender to him. The fully mature development of both the righteous and the wicked is necessary for the final vindication of God's character and his law. That's why point number five is important. That's why this must be demonstrated before the great controversy can come to an end. All right, now, a little more about this Trojan horse that has insinuated itself into the heart of Adventism. A little history. We can trace its beginnings in the United States to a new to Protestant interpretation of prophecy called futurism. This method was actually begun by Catholic scholars to deflect the Protestants' identification of the Catholic Church as Babylon and the Pope as Antichrist. So all the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation were placed in the future with a yet unknown individual as the Antichrist. Don't know who he will be. In the Protestant version, the 70th week of Daniel 9 was placed in the future. The Old Testament prophecies of the, ref, of the restoration of the Jewish nation would be completely, literally fulfilled. The temple would be rebuilt. The battle of Armageddon would be the final battle between the Jews and the heathen nations. Also included is a secret rapture of the faithful so they will not have to go through the horrors of Armageddon. These beliefs are shared by a number of conservative Protestant churches who believe in the absolute authority of Scripture and the soon coming of Jesus Christ, and who emphasize evangelistic fervor and church growth, all of which are shared by Adventism. You can see why there could be a link there. There are a few other evangelical teachings here that come to mind. Uh, there is the teaching that, uh, as I said, the secret rapture will take people to heaven uh, before uh, the other, before Jesus comes. There is the teaching of the immortal soul 
in which people will go to heaven or hell right after death. Um, there is the teacher, teaching of an eternally burning hell fire. These are all common beliefs of this evangelical system. And, of course, the Sabbath can't be that important. That's a Jewish custom. We don't consider that important anymore. Just a few things that are in addition to those five major points. Now, the interesting thing about the evangelical movement in the United States in the last 40 years is that it has moved into the political arena. During the early 1800s, there were several political parties who eventually settled into two parties, the Whigs and the Democrats. But soon the Whig party disintegrated and it was replaced by the Republican Party. These are our parties today. But friends, the positions of these parties have changed completely in time so that our parties as we know them today are not even close to what they were 50 or 100 years ago. Today, these parties have become so polarized and demonization has become the norm that labeling is the only issue. If you don't agree with my party, you're the enemy. That's where we are today. The evangelical movement has immersed itself in modern power politics. In the 1950s, religion and politics began to form an alliance. Billy Graham and other evangelicals began to promote anti-communism. One nation under God became a catchphrase during that period of time. Religious leaders began to promote free enterprise and big business. They talked about the United States as a Christian nation. And there was even a proposed constitutional amendment about protecting school prayers in public schools. You've, you're familiar with all of that. As evangelical theology has become increasingly linked with politics, an interesting thing has taken place. Since evangelicals were primarily conservative, believing in the authority of the Bible, their political leanings became exclusively conservative. And evangelical theology began to take second place to evangelical politics, conservative politics. Evangelicals saw conservative politics as their only way to effect moral change in America, to save America. Modern society, as you well know, has been damaged by godlessness and lawlessness, with the absolute truth being replaced with, well, whatever works for me, that's okay. The boundaries of sexuality are being hopelessly blurred, as you all know right now. So, evangelical conservatism joined itself permanently to conservative politics as the only way to defeat the moral degeneracy in our United States and to set up the way for Jesus to return to this earth for the 1,000 year millennial rule that he will set up here, which is one of their beliefs as well. So since Adventists share many concerns about America with evangelicals, it was very easy to agree with them about conservative politics being the only way to nullify the corrosive influence of liberal religious beliefs combined with liberal politics. Once again, our defenses against liberalism outside our walls allowed us to ignore the dangerous Trojan horse of conservative religion and politics together, invading our minds and our churches. If only, if only we would have followed Ellen White's wise counsel, inspired counsel, to bury political questions, we might not have opened the doors of the tro to the Trojan horse so widely. Suddenly, a new issue took center stage in the religious evangelical alliance with politics. It was called abortion. Now, right here, I want to make it very clear that Adventism is opposed to abortion on demand as a method of birth control. We are totally opposed to that. I'm talking here about how abortion has become a political issue. Back in 1968, even Christianity Today, which is an evangelical magazine, refused to call abortion sinful. That's 1968. In 1971, delegates to the Southern Baptist Convention allowed abortion under certain defined circumstances, which they reaffirmed again in 1974 and 1976. But in 1979, opposition to abortion became a rallying cry for evangelicals due to the influence of a Catholic at activist who coined the term moral majority 
And he saw the effectiveness of the abortion issue in defeating some very prominent liberal, theolog liberal politicians in 1978. This resulted in the modern religious right as we know it today and the Evangelical Catholic Alliance, which believes that morality can and should be a matter for political legislation. Get the right people elected, they'll get the job done. In 1984, a New York governor said, Are we asking government to make criminal what we believe to be sinful because we ourselves can't stop committing the sin? The failure here is not Caesar's. The failure is our failure, the failure of the entire people of God. Now make no mistake, the use of civil power by apostate Christianity is making coercion a substitute for conversion and will lead directly to the formation of the image to the beast. It is very significant, I think, that in August 2018, just a year ago, a state-like dinner was held at the White House for 100 evangelical leaders to celebrate evangelical leadership, especially in politics. It would be well for us to remind ourselves that religious liberty means two different things for Adventists and for evangelicals. Adventists want to allow freedom of conscience for all, especially minority be religious beliefs. We advocate freedom for Catholics, for Protestants, for Buddhists, for Muslims, even atheists. But evangelicals and conservative Catholics advocate liberty for their version of Christianity, since they believe that's the only way of salvation, while other beliefs are heathen and do not merit special protection. The disturbing reality is that the same people who stand the strongest against abortion and who stand for moral values are the same people who want to unite with conservative Catholics to restore a Christian dominionism, that's the term, Christian dominionism that will trample on freedom of religion for minorities. Evangelical theology has been hidden inside evangelical politics and is the greatest danger our church has faced from outside Adventism. And I say how tragic it is that evangelical theology has penetrated so deeply into Adventist theology that we are actually promoting it at the highest scholarly levels and we are marginalizing the beliefs of those who believe in genuine Adventism we're calling them fanatics and fringe groups. Well, this is the Trojan horse that is fascinating Adventism right now. And we allow it in our midst at the peril of our reason for existence. We have formed our Maginot line against attacks by the enemy. And Satan has bypassed those carefully formed defenses by appearing to be our friend and our ally, since we are also opposed to things like abortion and homosexuality. We are being dragged into the muck of political involvement. And we don't seem to realize that the evangelical message and evangelical politics are broken cisterns. They are the false prophet of Revelation, Babylon, with their hands stretching across the gulf to form the image to the beast. And I ask, can we really trust and ally with a movement because it supports a few strands of truth. The army outside the walls is hiding inside the horse while we sleep on. And so, with this very brief presentation that I wanted to make tonight about this extremely dangerous thing that is happening in Adventism. We desperately need to return to our Adventist pioneers who refused to get involved in party politics. They stood, yes, they stood for moral issues like temperance and religious liberty. They did oppose errors in society like slavery, even defying immoral laws like the Fugitive Slave Act. But they never supported it, the political parties of their day and they refuse to get involved in the dirt of power politics, as we have seen it in recent years. We, my friends, are here for two primary purposes. We are to prepare our characters to receive the seal of God, put the final nail in the coffin of Satan's lies that God's law cannot be kept, that he is asking too, too much of us. And second, 
to prepare our hearts to be ready for the latter rain and take this message of truth to every corner of planet Earth. Matthew 24, 14 will see its fulfillment as the gospel is taken to the whole world so that, so that God can finally say in Revelation 12, 14, here are they that actually keep my commandments. Take a look at them, world. Take a look at them, universe. Take a look at them, Satan. Your lies are defeated. And I just say, may that day come soon. This issue, my friends, is not going away. This issue is getting stronger, and it will continue to rise until we are facing things that we have never seen before in our lifetime as Seventh-day Adventists in this wonderful country of religious liberty. We are going to see some things because of this Trojan horse that is coming right into our midst. We've got to identify it. We've got to know what it is. And tomorrow, and especially in the afternoon, in the afternoon, I'm going to be looking at the specifics of this message that has come to us from within Adventism, as I said, four books, three from Andrews University, the seminary, one from the Pacific Union. These books that have challenged everything I am saying to you this evening and that I have said to you over the many years that I have been with you in this, in this church. This is a really, really crucial weekend, as I see it, for us to understand and be ready for Satan's deceptions. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, I pray that as Satan is devising his last attempt to destroy this message and this movement, I pray that every one of your remnant people here upon earth may be preparing without any delay to receive the seal of God by heart surrender, by yielding everything that we understand and know to be truth before it's too late. I pray that we will be able to resist to see and resist the dangerous deceptions that are coming into our midst. And I pray that this will be the time that we will not have to pass it off to another generation, that this will be the time when your work on earth can be finished, your people can be sealed, and Jesus will come. Thank you, Lord. We are trusting in your promises. We believe them. And we will not abandon them. In Jesus' name, amen.